So we're picking up with the age of Napoleon. Um, between 1799 and 1815, this man is going to dominate Europe. And it's kind of an interesting thing because uh, depending on who you talk to, some people view him as the hero of France and, and somebody who helped to bring France into um, a time of power. And others view him as the devil incarnate, that he was the worst thing ever to happen to France. So it kind of depends on who you're talking to uh, on this guy, on, on whether or not what he did was actually good or not. So what does he actually do? Well, his rise to power. Uh, Napoleon was born on the island of Corsica. Uh, which is a, a territory of France, and his parents were minor nobles, so they had a little money, but it wasn't a ton. It's not like he was born very, very wealthy. Um, at the age of nine, he is going to be sent to France to train for the military, and he is going to rise very quickly in the ranks of the military, so he does very well for himself. By December of 19, uh, or 1793, sorry, December of 1793, uh, he is going to distinguish himself with the military by driving the British out of the city of Toulon, um, and he has several victories that will follow that. But his success is going to lead into his ambition that he sees himself as being someone who could make a difference, and so he he has a lot of ambition to become a general and then eventually a politician. And so he is going to help overthrow the Directory, which is that group that came about after the Reign of Terror. And he is going to be named First Consul, which, if you remember, comes from the Roman time period. Um, Julius Caesar was a First Consul. Remember, the, the consuls were the ones who protected the city of Rome. Well, he doesn't control Rome, but he's going to take on that title of First Consul. And he'll, he'll be declared First Consul for life. And two years later, he's named the Emperor of France. Remember that the Constitution had gotten rid of a monarchy, so they're going to reestablish it just for this guy. So that kind of tells you a little bit about him. Um, the French very strongly support Napoleon. They felt that he was the answer to all their problems. Well, his policies say a lot about him. He did have a series of reforms to try and fix what the problems were in France. He's going to modernize finance. He's going to control prices. He's going to create new industry in France. All of this is good stuff. He's going to build roads and canals, and he, he installs a system of public schools. He also is going to make peace with the Catholic Church. Now remember the Catholic Church was not very happy with the French government because they had broken away and, and said, you know, we, we don't have to listen to you anymore. And so they weren't very happy with them for that. They sold their land and all that kind of stuff. And he actually is going to make some attempts to become nice to the, the Catholic Church again. Uh, he also is going to encourage the emigres to return back to France. Remember those emigres were the people who left France, the nobles, basically, because all their stuff was taken away from them. And, and so they were spreading all these stories about how horrible life was in France. And so he's going to encourage them to come back and, and say, you can reclaim your land and, and you can contribute to our new government. Um, he also will give peasants the rights to the land that they had bought from the church when that land had been sold. A lot of peasants bought it up because land was a way to get money. You know, it was a way of, to have ownership. And so he's going to say, no, you get to keep that land. The church doesn't get to take it back. And so they get to keep that land. He also is going to make all careers open to talent rather than birth. That even if you were born a noble, doesn't mean that just because your dad had the job, you get it. It, it could go to somebody who's a little bit more talented than you, perhaps. Uh, Napoleon will eventually establish what's called the Napoleonic Code. And this Napoleonic Code is is kind of this mantra for, for the French people. It talked about equality of all citizens before the law. It talked about religious toleration. Uh, it talked about uh, that you could advance based on your talent or your skills, not necessarily your wealth or your social standing. He values order and authority but he also values that over individual rights. And so that's kind of a downfall to that. He values order and authority, but if if that gets it, or if, if your individual rights get in the way of that, your individual rights are gone. Um, women 
actually are going to lose most of their rights that they had gained during the French Revolution under Napoleon. So that's another downside to his, his rule. Um, but as emperor, he felt it was his job to gain an empire. And so he's going to redraw the map of Europe. He's going to annex a lot of land, which basically just means he adds it outright, that he's going to just add it to his territory. And, and um, if you wanted to take it back, you're going to have to fight him for it. But he has it. And so he's going to take on the, or take or not take on. He's going to annex the Netherlands and Belgium and parts of Italy and Germany. He's just going to take over and, and basically force those governments to say, you can have the land or they're going to have to fight him for it. Eventually, he will create what's called the Confederation of the Rhine. And these are 38 countries that he puts under French protection. And basically, it was, you're going to let me put my friends and family on your thrones of your government. They're going to be in charge of you. And if you don't do that, I'm going to attack you. So there's your choices. You're going to either let me put my friends and family into places of power in your countries or I'm going to attack you. So it's because of this that you get the French versus the British because the British refused to even acknowledge Napoleon, really. Um, and the British relied very heavily on their naval power. They had the strongest navy in the world at this time. And so France is going to try to invade Britain, but it doesn't really work. So what they decide to do instead is to cut off trade and say, you can't trade with any of Europe, I could, because Napoleon basically it controls all of Europe at this point. And so if the British didn't want to behave, they're not going to get anything from Europe. They're going to have to figure out where else to get it on their own. Well, the British will respond with their own blockade and said, fine, you want to play that way, we can do that too. You may have stuff in Europe, but you don't have stuff from Asia, you don't have stuff from the Americas, you don't have stuff from Africa, and you're not going to get it either. So smuggling is going to increase as a result of this. Now, it's not to say that the that Napoleon didn't have challenges. He did. He had, he had challenges to his empire. In fact, nationalism is going to work against the French. Remember, nationalism is promoting your country, wanting it to be the best. Well, other countries like the idea of the revolution. They like the ideas of the government reforms that happened, but they don't necessarily like the French culture. So they may want to do what France was doing, but they don't want to be French doing it, if that makes sense. So they're going to encounter resistance in, di in different parts of Europe. For example, in Spain, Napoleon is going to replace the Spanish king with uh, Napoleon's brother. He's going to replace the king. And his king or his brother tries to reform the church. Spain was very, very Catholic. And so they wanted to reform the church and get a little less interference and in influence from the church. But the Spanish people themselves are going to be, remain very, very loyal to their own king and to the church as well. And so uh, rather than take on Napoleon's army head on, they're going to engage in what's called guerrilla warfare. And guerrilla warfare is more like hit and run attacks and ambushes and raids rather than all my army versus all your army and see who wins. So it's kind of like being a mosquito constantly bugging and buzzing around the, the army as opposed to actually taking them on head on. Um, and because of this, Napoleon has to keep a large number of French troops in Spain because they have to keep dealing with this, which means that he's going to be weaker in other areas as well. For example, in Russia, uh, the Russians at first are going to retreat in front of Napoleon's army just because he was that good. The Russians just keep backing further and further and he gains more and more territory but what they are doing as they are retreating is they're following a scorched earth policy and this scorched earth policy basically says that as you retreat you burn everything you burn crops you burn the villages to the ground you poison the wells you you do whatever it takes so that your enemy can have nothing to sustain him as he takes over this destroyed territory and so the French keep advancing and advancing, but what they don't realize is that the Russian winter is coming on. And so the Russian winter lasts for six months, and it is a harsh winter. But the French aren't really expecting that. They didn't really understand that part of the world. And so the French military is basically stuck in, in Russia with no supplies and, and 
no way to get supplies and they're cold and they're hungry and so eventually they're going to turn home and so they stop fighting the Russians which was the Russian plan all along they, they meant to do this but the French on, on the way home they have to fight for survival they're battling for survival and a lot of them are going to die of starvation not because of, of wounds or anything or because of the war they're dying of starvation a lot of them desert they're going to leave um, what's considered illegally um, from the military uh, so it's a huge problem for Napoleon and his military and so these kinds of little little things are going to uh, lead to the downfall of Napoleon and eventually there's going to be this alliance between Russia Britain Austria and Prussia and this alliance is going to continue to to nip and, and, and bite at the French military and just weaken it by little bits here and there. And eventually Nap Napoleon's going to be forced to abdicate. And abdicate means that he's going to step down from power. He's going to give up the power of his throne. And when he abdicates, these, this alliance is going to exile him to a little island. And this island is called Elba, E-L-B-A. And um, they're going to install a monarch in France again from uh, the, the same family that had it before the revolution. And so Louis the 18th is going to take over in France. Now Louis is going to accept the Napoleonic Code. He's going to accept the, um, the land settlements that uh, Napoleon had instituted that the, you know like the French could keep their their church lands that they had purchased and, and those kinds of things. So he's trying to, to keep some of the good stuff that Napoleon had done. But um, as the nobles return, as those emigres are returning, because now they feel it's safe with a, with a king in charge rather than Napoleon, um, as they are returning back to France, they want revenge. And they want revenge on these people that, that kicked them out of the country. And so because of this, the peasants, who all of a sudden all their stuff's getting taken away from them again, their loyalty is going to go back to Napoleon, because at least under Napoleon, things were great. And so they arrange for his escape from the island of Elba. And Napoleon is going to return to France and he's going to gather together his troops and he's going to march on Paris and he enters into Paris. However, he's a victor there for only a hundred days um, because those allies are going to group together and they're going to meet him. And, and he meets the allies at Waterloo and Waterloo is this battlefield in Belgium. And the, the British were led by the Duke of Wellington. And this battle takes place between the French and, and these allies. And it's a day-long battle, but Napoleon eventually loses. His, he just didn't have enough time and resources to really put together a formidable foe. And so um, Napoleon loses. And again, he's exiled, this time to a different island. This one is to St. Helena. and just because it has better security basically and he will die there in 1821 now Napoleon's legacy in France he does help to spread the ideas of the revolution uh, the, the idea of equality and fraternity and, and liberty he does increase nationalism in France there's a strong sense of, of French loyalty and Fr French patriotism and he also is going to sell a little chunk of land called the Louisiana Territory to America and because of that that's going to kind of change the world scene because America becomes powerful because it doubles their size and they're able to become a very powerful uh, force in the world later on after Waterloo the Congress of Vienna is going to be held and this is where you have the allies who the the, the British and the Bel uh, the British and the the Russians and the Austrians and uh, the Prussians are all going to meet together and what they're going to try to do is restore stability to Europe because basically there's been war in one place or another for the last 25 years and they're just tired of it so they're like we need to figure out what to do in order to make it so this doesn't happen again and so their chief goal is to get a lasting peace but also to protect the system of monarchy because most countries at this time still had a monarchy so they want to protect that system and so what basically they do is they return to the status quo and status quo is just the way things were before so they want to return back to the way things were before the French Revolution 
So the Congress of Vienna comes up with the Vienna Settlement. And what they do is they redraw the map of Europe. And what they're going to do is they're going to put France kind of in the middle, but they're going to surround France on all sides with strong countries to basically make sure that France doesn't become powerful again. And they're also going to push for legitimacy. And legitimacy is hereditary monarchs that in the thrones of Europe, it would pass from father to son or father to daughter or whatever. But the problems that we're going to see is that when they recreate or when they redraw this map of Europe, they don't really pay attention to cultures or nationalities. And they don't quite um, understand that people feel very centered on their, their culture or their nationality. And so when you divide them up, they're going to want to get back together with their uh, cultural group. And that's going to cause some problems later on.